At an advanced divisional headquarters, I met some men doing one of the most thankless jobs that soldiers can ever be given, namely supervising a rearguard action against a much bigger army in strange country that gets more difficult every mile you go back. The commanding officer of a frontier force battalion led his men through the jungle, himself armed with a revolver and a haversack of hand grenades. It's so filthily hot and steamy in the jungle, you can feel your energy being drawn out of you. But operating with this force were some Gurkhas. The jungle's nothing to them. It was an inspiring sight to watch them hacking their way through with those positively terrifying knives. It'll be God help the Japs if ever it comes to a hand-to-hand -hand fight with the Gurkhas. There were no enemy troops in the jungle, but I soon heard something overhead that I didn't like. It wasn't our own bombers, but the Japs, letting fly at undefended Tongu. in the grip of the flames and nothing could save it. Outside the jungle, Burma is tinder dry at this time of the year. A single incendiary bomb would have started a big blaze, let alone scores of them with some HE thrown in. So here it was again, another of war's familiar sights. Not much more than a year ago, I was in the city of London, picking my way between burning buildings, filming the inferno around St. Paul's. And now I was here, thousands of miles to the east, doing the same sort of thing. Daylight revealed utter devastation. The whole of the poorer quarter of the town around the bazaar was little more than hot ashes. I don't know how many people were killed. It happened so suddenly that hundreds must have been trapped. Those that escaped formed into the inevitable army of the lost and hopeless. I haven't seen anything quite so hopeless since I drove past those unforgettable refugees in the Battle of France. God pity them, man won't. The last few days I spent in Burma, before I left for Calcutta, I ran across the Gloucester Regiment, in fact almost ran into them. They'd made a local counter-attack and were just going to embark on a mopping up operation in a village from which the Japs were driven out. Their colonel ordered the advance and I went forward with them. One of the men in the brand carrier was a Russian, Viktor Filatov. I hadn't time to ask him how he came to be fighting in the British Army. His party had an Italian Breda gun, by the way. Arthur Toghill of Bristol and his pal Jack Godwin of Sicester told me the Breda was one of hundreds captured in Libya. They were very useful. They had mortars too mounted on lorries. Lieutenant Christensen picked out some retreating Japs. I scooted along with the rest. It was too hot to stay where I was. Across the track, into the village itself, the Gloucesters very cautiously went forward, making a house-to-house -house search, up to all the tricks practiced by an enemy as cunning as a cage of monkeys. Now and again, they took a pot at the Japs, dashing from one cover to another.
Forward went the Gloucesters to press home their advantage. There weren't many counter-attacks in Burma. I felt more than a little proud that I'd seen one of them. And I think it was a privilege, too, to meet those Gloucesters, holding up an army, and in so doing, performing one of the greatest feats in military history. They were the last troops I saw before leaving that beautiful country. Yes, the sun has set over Burma, but not permanently. It will be seen again, perhaps before long, rising in a great ball of glory in the dawn of a better age. Thank you.